Welcome everyone to Cities on a Plate. It's very exciting to see you all this evening. Today we're in Kampala, the capital city of Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Um, please type in what city you're joining us from in the chat. Um, lovely New York, lovely. The Cities on a Plate series, as many of you know, was born out of a lot of quarantine cooking that I did in 2020, uh, where I found myself suddenly mining childhood recipes um, and trying to recreate dishes from the different places I traveled to and lived in in the world. So it's wonderful to be able to break bread with you all again, together, virtually as a family, regardless of where we are located in the world. Uh, today, Kampala on a Plate is all about celebrating those trailblazers who are changing the national landscape through food in Uganda. So we're hearing from Sophia Musoki, founder and creative director of the Kitchen in Uganda food blog. Then we have a delicious Kampala-inspired Rolex demo by the Rolex chick herself, Joanita Binenema. And then we'll hear from Jonathan Nalebo, who's the co-founder and managing director of the Rolex Initiative. So as usual, we're keeping things nice and interactive. Um, remember, you can type in your questions and comments in the chat. Steph is moderating that for us tonight. So let's kick off with um, Sophie. Your gorgeous images really introduced the world to Ugandan cuisine in a way that we'd never seen before. Um, take us through an intro to Ugandan food and your personal journey with A Kitchen in Uganda, your blog. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you for having me. And um, my name is Sophia Musaki. I am a Ugandan from Uganda. And today I will be talking to you about my journey with food, how it all started. But before we do that, let me just share a brief introduction to Ugandan food and why I am so passionate about it and why it is very unique. Next slide. All right, so Uganda is at the crossroads of multiple ethnicities, and this is important to note because these cultural integrations feature in the food that we eat. So um, to the north, we are bordered by South Sudan, to the west, we're bordered by Congo, to the southwest, Rwanda, Tanzania to the south, and then Kenya to the east. And you will notice that each of these borders have similarities. And so you'll find that there's a little bit of cultures from the south of South Sudan into Uganda. The same goes for Congo, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya. And aside from these um, internal influences, we also have external influences. Next slide where we have the British colonial influence, which we all are aware of, which um, where the country actually came from. And so you'll find that because of this influence, you will find that we, we take our meals at specific times of the day. We enjoy taking tea as well. And um, um, Ugandans were so unique that even when it's really hot, you still find a person taking a hot cup of tea. That's how entrenched the culture is in Uganda. And then we also have the East African Arab trade influence, which is where we get our love of fried food. So foods like mandazi, which um, there it's it's a fried dough. I'm sure you've heard of it. And then we also have foods like pilau, which are also come from this influence. And then we have the Indian influence, where we get our love or spicing food with curry. So you'll find that most of Ugandan food is heavily spiced with curry. And this is because of the fact that a lot of Indians came and settled in the land and they introduced us to this spice. And ever since then, it is something that we use. It's only recently that we've started branching out to other forms of spices and, and flavorings. And then of course we have the modern Western influence where you get um, everything in between. So. We do have five-star restaurants. We do have um, seafood. We take seafood. And we do have a lake, multiple lakes, actually. But we also have 
um, restaurants that feature seafood that is not available in the lake. Um, and so we have French cuisine, we have Italian cuisine, we have Asian cuisine, we have everything really. We even have fast food chains. So this this it's it's that's why I call it, that's why I call it a melting pot of flavors because there's everything you need. If you want something traditional, you can get that. And if you want something international, intercontinental, you can get that as well. Next slide. So just to share with you a little bit about some of our traditional indigenous dishes, we have matoke, which is the first photo you saw when the slide began. And these are green bananas that are mashed and the consistency is similar to mashed potatoes. And this is a good vehicle for really rich and hearty stews. And then we have wombo, which are banana leaves steamed stew. And this can range from vegetables to meat to fish as well and it is usually served with matoke. So the uniqueness of Luombo is that the process of wrapping the stew in banana leaves and then steaming that helps infuse the banana leaf flavor into the stew and it creates a really unique flavor and offering. And then we have Malewa, which is the photo on my left. And this is tender bamboo shoots that are smoked and then dried and this process helps preserve them, but it also creates flavor because what you eat, the taste is compared to eating dried mushrooms. Next slide, please. And then we have a shawe, which is um, whipped ghee sauce. And this comes from the Western part of the region where um, the people, the region people are catalysts pastoralists rather, yes, and they had a lot of animals. So there's a lot of milk and butter in that region. So this is a sauce that is made from whipping um, ghee, which is clarified butter. And what it creates is a consistency similar to whipped cream and the chemical composition changes and so does the flavor. It's really unique and I encourage you to taste it. And then we have a kalo, which is millet, also the meal. And this is grown this is eaten wherever millet and sorghum and cassava are grown. So it's almost similar to the West African swallow where we use it also, also as a vehicle to transport hearty stews. And then lastly, we have sombe, which is cassava leaf stew. And this is my favorite stew personally because it's from where I come from. I come from the Western part, which is bordering Congo. So we eat this a lot. And the stew is made by grinding tender cassava leaves and then cooking them with fish, palm oil, and it really infuses a lot of flavors and it's really rich. And so it is eaten with foods like akalo or matoke. Um, next slide. I also want to mention here, Sophie, I forgot to say in the beginning that all the images in this presentation are Sophie's images from her blog um, that she's sharing with us, which are really beautiful images to see. All right, so what is a kitchen in Uganda? So my journey with food started with a kitchen in Uganda. Um, I had always been interested in food and I remember earlier on, I wanted to either go to, go to culinary school or something. I knew I always wanted to work in the food industry. And so I knew that, I knew what I wanted to do, but the, the, the road, the journey was not clear for me. And so I started seeing people creating food blogs, sharing what they were eating, what they were cooking. And so I started a food blog. So basically, A Kitchen in Uganda is a food blog which explores um, Ugandan food, Ugandan cuisine, its influences through storytelling and visual representation. So you will find that um, a lot of emphasis is put on the photos, just like Lucia has mentioned, because I want it, I want people reading this blog to be able to visually imagine what Ugandan food is. And this also came from the realization that not a lot of um, photos of African food in general, but most especially Ugandan food are not online on the internet. So for example, if you're looking for a food like um, Firinda, which is the photo here. Firinda is a peeled bean stew, 
which is also really delicious. So if you're looking for, uh, for Firinda on the internet, if you Google Firinda, chances are you won't find that many photos. And if you find them, they're probably not that appealing. And I believe that storytelling and visual storytelling is important in helping create um, narratives. So my journey with Action in Uganda is to be able to storytell through writing about food and taking photos of food. Next slide, please. Right, so this is just another example of some of the foods I've taken. Um, the photo on the left is katogo, which are, I wouldn't call it a staple dish, but it is very common. It features in almost each household. And this is a convenient food, which is made of bananas, stewed with either tomatoes, sometimes beans, sometimes meat even. And this is really a convenient food that is eaten for breakfast. And then on the right, we have some beans, fresh beans that are being shelled. Again, I really wanted to put emphasis on the fact that we, I produce, we have good photos representing our food because then it helps people understand what they're looking at, visualize what they're looking at. And if they ever visit the country, then they're able to identify what they see based on these photos. Next slide. Right, so this is just a screenshot of the blog, A Kitchen in Uganda. And I have been fortunate enough to work with many people within the industry. And this blog has been featured on CNN. Um, it has also been featured on City Press and many other um, publishing, uh, many other websites and publishers. And this has been very instrumental in introducing the world to Ugandan food because now we have a starting point to explore the food. And although this blog is not exhaustive because it's one voice speaking, I believe this is just the starting point for people to learn more and explore more about the food. Next slide, please. Right, so um, again, these are more photos of what I have done. So on the left, you can see is posho. And posho is almost similar to um, pap in Southern Africa, where it's made out of white maize. And we eat this a lot with a lot of different stills. And then on the right, we have um, a very unique sweet, which is called kabalagala or pancakes, Ugandan pancakes. And this is made out of bananas and cassava flour, which are then fried. And it's, it's I wouldn't say it's similar to banana bread because the process of mixing cassava flour with bananas and then frying them creates a different texture and flavor profile. So if you ever visit the country, please look out for Kabbalah Gala or pancakes. Next right. slide. I also love the conversations you have around some of the foods you introduce. So for the, you know, pancake styles, you started a whole dialogue about, you know, why don't, why is it that we don't have as much sweet stuff in Ugandan cuisine or can anyone think of any other sort of desserts um, that we have. I mean, I think the conversations you have are very interesting too. Right, right. So that's, that's, that's essentially the goal of this because, and you've mentioned it, thank you for mentioning it. So whenever I share this food, I always want it to be a conversation. So for example, this photo here, um, when I shared it, people were like, oh my God, this reminds me of my grandmother's home. And that was really great for me because these are the conversations I am hoping to initiate and help nurture so that, you know, we can even discuss more and, you know, the influences, what makes us eat what we eat and, you know, just the whole conversations. So some of these photos and these um, blog posts are actually conversation starters. And it's great that you've mentioned that because I had, I had planned to talk about that, but I had missed it. Mm -hmm. So um, um, aside from these being conversation starters, I also want to create a community where people can be free to choose have conversations about food. And you find that most of the times we don't really have these conversations. I mean, food is essential to our well-being, to our living. But sometimes I think having conversations helps us understand on a deeper level what that actually means to us. And so, for example, you'll find that when I initiated this conversation about pancakes and how we don't have sweets, there's a lot of responses that I got and people are sharing their experiences. And they mentioned that 
we heavily rely on fresh produce. So you find that we have a lot of fruits and these fruits and they are highly, they have a lot of sugar content. So that acted as yeah. dessert. So you'll find that the, the diet, Ugandan diet typically doesn't have dessert, but of course you will find desserts and this is because of the external influences. But generally, as long as you can find a mango to eat, a banana, a pineapple to eat, then you are really set, you're good to go. Another reason I continue to blog, I've been blogging since 2014. And another reason I continue to do this is to educate. When I started this, I didn't know much of what I know now. And so in a way, it's a way for me to learn about our food cultures because they're never taught about, they, we are never taught about these cultures in school. And so it is something where we just have to have conversations, you know, informal conversations. So I want this to be a space where we learn collectively as Ugandans and as a people generally, so that you know we can know what to do when an opportunity arises. And lastly, it's a platform to share. So not only do I share, but I also encourage people to share what they have learned, what they have made. If they've made anything from the blog, they will share with me as well. Next Fantastic. slide. Right, and then that's I just some more photos. So that is the mandazi I was talking about, which is very popular. This is a popular breakfast snack. So if a person is up and about running in the city, um, you'll find that most likely they'll get a cup of tea and a piece of mandazi. And then on the right- Mandazi, is like, a, mandazi is like a fried dough, hey, yes. essentially. Sort of, yes. um, we call them fat cooks in, in most of Southern Africa. That's yeah, true, that's true. the fried dough, like a donut. Mm. That's true. And then on the right, I also have um, a photo of pumpkin leaves. And this was also a great conversation starter because um, most people didn't realize, most people, we had the conversation about how we have a lot of green vegetables actually available to us, but we don't usually tap into that opportunity because, you know, we sometimes think it just has to be, I don't know, spinach or... I don't know, kale, but there's so much more. So when I shared this, people were intrigued and they said, I didn't know, especially people who are not Ugandans, they were saying, I didn't know that you could actually eat the leaves of a pumpkin. So this was really great to also start a conversation and um, you know, have people express themselves, share their experiences. And so they really, that's what the blog is all about. It's about starting conversations, sharing experiences, having a community where we can just talk about food. And that's so, it for now. Sophie, we have a question from the chat from Tafadza. Uh, is there any conflict between traditional dishes and maybe iterations of those by new generation chefs? That's a good question, thank you. So there is a conflict, yes, for sure. And this is because in my personal observation, this is because there has not been much emphasis put on preserving the traditional foods. So whenever there is any um, fusion or transformation, um, iteration of the traditional food, there's always um, a clap back, if I may, um, where people are, requesting for the traditional to be preserved. And that's an important point for them to point out because just like I mentioned, this food has not been taught to us formally. And so most of the information you'll find that it's information passed, to, passed, passed down onto us by our relatives, you know, our grandparents, our parents, our uncles, our aunties. So it's just something people know from storytelling and not necessarily from a formal education point of view. So I think there is a need for us to actually put effort into gathering these stories, this knowledge of these traditional foods and um, putting them in a place or making them available for the public so that they know that this is how Kabbalah is made. But if you ever choose to upgrade it or put your own twist to it, you can do that knowing that the information for the original is there and available for you and it's kept safe. I hope I've answered the question. Yeah, I'm, this is selfishly me asking, but I'm curious, what have you, how have you thought about um, kind of the Ugandan cuisine evolving? Because I think there's sometimes this element of 
traditional food being the one thing we should stick to, but how have you seen it evolve with chefs taking on new iterations? Um, it has evolved. Um, personally, when I started out, I started out with um, sharing creative um, fusion of what what I grew up knowing. So, and I remember I got a lot of, of pushback <laughs> um, from the blog because people say that's not how you do it. That's not how it's supposed to be done. And it made me take a step back and look and realize that actually yes. As much as we want to do this, um, as much as we want to create new, new um, flavors, new flavor pairings and um, dishes from these traditional dishes, I think there's a need for actually people to first know, because I believe it is a foundation. So there, yes, there is people, there are people who are, who are really good at this, who are creating um, new dishes, exciting dishes, flavor profiles flavor pairing that are really exciting. And I think we should be able to encourage both of these people, people who are gatekeeping or safekeeping rather the traditional food and people who are willing to go out of this mold and create new flavor pairings. And this is where I think I fit in because I have worked with some restaurants to create um, dishes and menus and that are taking from the traditional, mixing it with a new and creating something exciting. So I think it is a conversation we need to have. And I know it will benefit us because we will be honoring what is already there and building on it to create something new because culture is not static, it evolves with the people. Awesome. And then we have another question. You mentioned that there are so many different elements and influences on Ugandan cuisine. Are there also crossovers there between, let's say, Brazilian and Ugandan cuisine? All right. So Brazilian, um, maybe Brazil, no, <laughs> because we don't really have, um, so Uganda is a landlocked country, so we don't have any, um, any seaport. And so this kind of limits our influence, our, our external influence, but the influences that we do have are Indian influences. So you will find that this, aside from food, um, the, the dressing code, um, the dressing is also influenced heavily by India. <laughs> so like there's a great Indian influence there, yes. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. So. Um, Sophie, since it was your image of uh, the Rolex that um, caught CNN's attention, I'm wondering if you have any idea where the term Rolex came from. Right. So um, the term Rolex, it's it's really hard to pinpoint where it came from. Like you cannot, I cannot just say it came from this person because it's a word that was there even in the early 2000s, and it's a street food. So, you know, people, um, street food vendors are very innovative because they're usually young people. So they're always coming up with cool new things to do. And that's where the word came from and the dish itself. So, um, and it became popularized around in Kampala itself, around Wandegea. And that is where the University Makerere is. And it's, it's a big influencer university so and it has international students sometimes so that's where it basically that's where it blew up <laughs> the popularity right. blew up from my career yes but the word itself basically means rolling eggs it's like saying rolled eggs quickly so the word caught on because you know you uganda we have a we have a saying in uganda where we say we, we change English words to fit our context and, and, and we call it Yuglish. <laughs> so Rolex is Yuglish in a way, yeah. Okay, okay, that's, that's we love, we love Yuglish. We love Yuglish, yeah, great. Thanks so much, Sophie. So our next panelist is the queen of redefined street food. Um, she's the owner of the Rolex Chick Eatery. Um, hi, Joanita, you're with us, yes. Just before your demo, um, tell us a bit about your path to becoming a food entrepreneur. The journey, journey started uh, with the love of food and I love breakfast. Considering the Rolex is uh, all the brunch, 
I decided to do the Rolex so that I could uh, cover the part of branch so that people could enjoy Rolex the whole day. Oh, fantastic. And, mm -hmm. what, uh, so, and what exactly are you making for us today? A chicken Rolex. Fantastic. We have a few people who are probably making it along uh, with you. Uh, we sent out an ingredients list. So go ahead, Joanita. I'll just be asking you questions as you as you go along. And and just to let everyone know, we're in the site where we're filming live from the Rolex Chick location, which is very exciting. My ingredients are already grated. That is the carrots, onion, and ginger. This is my warm water. So we're starting the chapati. I'm putting a bit of salt in my grated ingredients. Then I'll add my flour. Fantastic. Let me just get cold water here. Oh, it looks like we've lost Joanita a bit. But uh, while we wait to get her back, um, I have this funny story about the Rolex when I was in uh, Kampala, um, my introduction to Rolex. Um, so it was 11 a.m. And I'm walking around one day Gaya that Sophie mentioned looking for this Rolex. Um, and, but no one's serving it, everyone's saying, oh, you know, uh, there isn't any Rolex yet, there isn't any Rolex yet. And so we were like, where is this famous Rolex? And then it turned out, it's something that usually starts at 5, um, 5 p.m. going from the evening, um, going on through the night. So that, that was our introduction. It wasn't that no one was making it. It was just that we had looked for it at the wrong time. Let's see if we can go to Jonathan while we just sort out the demo technical issue. Um, Jonathan, are you with us? How has the pandemic changed uh, Rolex vending patterns? Well, Pracha, my name is Jonathan Alebo, uh, co-founder and managing director at Rolex Initiative. Rolex Initiative is a social economic enterprise uh, that was established in 2016 to promote Rolex as a tourism identifier for Uganda ensure an increase in hygienic meal making and financial inclusion for street food vendors in the country. Uh, the pandemic has um, drastically changed on how we do business in the country, but most, most importantly, internally. Uh, normally we used to have our festival that would gather um, close to 100, uh, to 100 vendors, but also about close to 20,000 revelers in Kampala and across the country. We have been able to move that online and last year we held um, eight episodes in the month of August, where we were going in two homes of celebrities as they showcased how they make their favorite Rolex at the comfort of their home. So they were competing against their spouse or their children. In just about 20 minutes, they were showcasing how fast and how best they can present the Rolex in uh, 20 minutes. So that's what we did. That's how greatly uh, COVID changed that we can longer have the gatherings. But also most importantly, uh, like you mentioned, your experience and they made, you made an experience with the Rolex is that majority vendors do um, get on street at around 5 p.m. in the evening. But right now with curfew and various limitations, they have limited working hours. So this has pushed majority of them to start working early. But also remember that uh, uh, majority vendors operate on this as a casual business, operate as a part-time business. And they have other engage engagements before, prior to the 5 p.m. Uh, hour that majority do operate. But now because there is a few and there is a limitation on the hours they can operate. And remember the night economy is the most profitable because they can be able to sell Rolex uh, ranging on, depending on how their clients do appear. Because these are people that are, are coming from the band, they are tired, but also they have the purchasing power, especially at night. But now the fact that they cannot go on with this ex experience they are pushed to work for shorter hours. And the, from our database that we've collected over the years and experience with majority of these young people, youth and women, majority of them have actually resorted uh, to other alternatives and the business ventures. Majority of them have actually left the city and gone to the villages. So that's how big 
and the um, financially constraining the pandemic has pushed the informal sector and the most importantly uh, the people that are whom I can term as a hand to mouth economy. Okay. The story of Rolex initiative actually started with a beauty pageant. Um, tell mm. us how that all began. Well, uh, in 2015, in 2015, uh, my wife was crowned the Miss uh, Busoga region in the Mirembe. So after the 2015, you know that a pageant gives a girl child an opportunity to showcase a project that they can do. And like I've said before, majority girls would choose to do charity, would choose to do a marathon, would choose to, to go into uh, noble causes. But while we sat and agreed on something that can be change the lives of majority young youth and women. So yes, after the pageant, the pageant, like I've said, it creates an opportunity for a girl child to create a project. We're able to start with a festival and the festival has been able to, to transit in, into an initiative. I'm curious what interesting Rolex innovations you've observed during the festivals. Yes, amazingly, uh, the Rolex basically, the Rolex festival is basically an opportunity uh, sort of where we uh, conglomerate the, the market for vendors. So basically people come and showcase the different recipes of Rolex. Uh, and most importantly, for us to be able to incorporate the local staple foods with also the international dishes. Just like the previous speaker mentioned, people have been able to do a shabby Rolex, people have been able to do beef Rolex, people have been able to do chicken Rolex. And amazingly and most interestingly, in 2019, when we went to Ginger for our maiden regional uh, exhibition, we were able to see people were doing flour out of sweet potatoes. So the value addition, the opportunity to expand on employment opportunities for young youth and women in the country, I think is immense with the Rolex. So people have done crazy, crazy, crazy exhibitions with the Rolex. And also majority people that are doing the modern Rolex, I must say that the majority of them have been inspired by our story and movement. And with, I think, and we are very uh, profoundly honored that these people have been able to spread the gospel of Rolex to the rest of the world and also the globe at all. I'm wondering what has the impact of Rolex initiative specifically been on the broader economy and society at large? Massively, brilliant question. What we've done is most importantly, we've we've organized these people. One, the authorities such as KCC and such as the government don't look at the street vendors as an economy. Basically, they're regarded as a shadow economy. They're not significant. They don't have safe and clear working positions. They don't have regulations. And also they're not entitled to most of the relief packages produced by the government. We've, we've uh, witnessed this recently, even with the Mioga program, the Rolex people, which is a big, big, big hub for the youth and women that maybe majority don't even make it after school, they cannot find a job, and those that are actually drop out uh, have not been covered in the interest groups of the government. But what we've done, because we want to interest the government and they look at this as a, an opportunity and as a job for majority of people, is we are organizing these young men and people in cluster management, whereby we're organizing them for their markets, ensuring that they can be able to access permits, because the moment with these people organized, they can adhere to uh, performance hygienic meal making, then authorities such as KCC can turn into enablers, can clear them by giving them permits. We can have clear and safe working environments so they can have a voice and representation. So that's, that's far what we have done. Also, we've worked with Microfinance Support Center in especially securing loans for these young uh, youth, for the youth and women that are, that, that, that are doing uh, the Rolex business. But challengingly, even when the interest normally, sorry, the loans come at a, a very crazy interest, yet we're trying to bounce back from, from a pandemic. And then um, what are some of the sort of more layman um, signs of a, a kind of, has there been a greater appreciation of Rolex just looking around in society? Come again. Has there been like a greater appreciation of Rolex, um, you know, when, when you look at the effect of your movement on, on just society in general in Uganda? Yes, yes, I must say, like I've said, majority of people have been able to come out and do the modern Rolex. I don't want to take credit, but uh, I think even uh, the lady on the show, the, the Rolex chick, has been inspired by our story. 
Uh, right. They have seen people like Yugaro. They've been inspired by our story because actually Yugaro performed at exhibited as if at the Maiden Maiden uh, Festival. So I think generally, and I've seen very many people doing the modern and improved Rolex coming up. Even now, the five star hotels are doing Rolex. Talk of Sheraton, talk of, talk of Serena. Uh, in 2018, we exhibited, I'm, I'm forgetting the hotel's name in, in Entebbe. That the premier, the yeah, Best Western. Yeah. yeah. That showcased the longest Rolex on the continent. So I think amazingly we've been able to inspire, but also international observers such as CNN, uh, I think Africa 24, I've been able to observe and identify that uh, Rolex is a big movement and a significant identifier for Uganda. Because I must tell you, Mark, you, in the top five things that identify Uganda, Rolex does, does make it. Apart from Idi Amin Dada, Eddie Kenzo, President William 70 and also I think Rolex comes in there as an identifier for Uganda. And now on Ugandan Airlines, you can get a Rolex too, I hear. Perfectly. Yes, yeah. I think what we are pushing for is that it should be served beyond the business class. Everyone on board should be able to identify and test a Ugandan Rolex. Right. Um, so what is the future for uh, the Rolex initiative? Well, first, actually, before the future, I, I mm. must ask, Jonathan, since this is something you went into in partnership with your um, wife, who makes the better Rolex between you and Enid? Yeah, I, I think we participated on one of the challenges. Uh, Sheila Gashumba was doing a cook and, cook and chat show whereby she invited us to showcase a Rolex and we did a chicken Rolex on site. And that is available on our YouTube channel. But who won, mm. Jonathan? Who won? Was it Enid no, or you? We, we didn't compete. We were making one together. And okay. much of the time she was doing it. I was only offering supervision roles. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> well, so, yes. Right, right, right. So, um, so what's the future for Rolex Initiative? Amazingly brilliant. One of, one of our goals is, uh, my phone is vibrating. Yes, yes, I can fix it. Can you still see me? I can see you beautifully. Yes, so one of the th things we are working on as Rolex Initiative, one of our vision and goals is that we would want to, we would dream of a day when Rolex makes it to the McDonald's. So that's it's a meal that is identified globally. Two, we want to create a franchise locally that everyone can be able to benefit from, especially the youth and women in the country. Three, I think we want to create one of the biggest movement in terms of training food business in the country. I mean, a culinary tra training institute in the country. And I think we can only give ourselves time. And uh, believe me, believe me, your God is on our side and be able to to expand this movement. But also most important, like I told you before, we would want to push the festival beyond uh, Uganda. We would want to go regional in the trade block, the East African trade block, go to Kenya, go to Rwanda, go to Tanzania, go to Kenya, and showcase. Amazingly, Cafe Java has now moved into Kenya. There are three outlets and they are selling the Rolex as part of their menu. So I think the movement is, is, is registering success. It's only a matter of time. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I, I had the pleasure of, of tasting it when, it when it came out last year and I saw Rolex on the Java menu here in Nairobi. I was very excited. Thanks so much, Jonathan. So Thank let's go me. back to um, Joanita. Let's see. So we left you when you were doing the water, I think, into the flour for the chapati. Yeah, and I, I needed the dough. So now I'm trying to roll out the chapati. Okay, so for someone who hasn't made the chapati before, um, just describe what you did. You you added the water to the flour, and then you kneaded yes. the dough. I kneaded until it's not until you feel it's not sticking on your hands. Okay, fantastic. You feel the dough is can come off your hands easily. Okay, great. Yeah, but not Go too ahead. hard though. Okay. Chapati is something that takes lots of uh, experience to get to be a good yes, one. Please. Yes. And how thin should the chapati be when you're rolling it out, Juanita? Uh, let me show it to you. Right. So you can't see through it, but it's still pretty flexible. 
right? Yeah. Stick and when you put it on the pan, away. you still stretch it out. After putting it on the pan that doesn't have oil but grease, you let okay. it cook a bit. So you flip it, put some oil. And you're using like a cast iron, a hard, heavy base for yes. your chapati. A normal pan can do. Okay. The best is the cast iron. Okay. So you wait for the chapati till it bubbles. You see the bubbles? If it gets closer, you... yes. there's some bubbles right here. Okay. So you can flip it. I use this to turn the chapati for even cooking. Was chapati something you made from very early on growing up, Joanita? Most of it I learned later, later on in life. But I had tried it from my younger days. Any tips for how you've gotten, how someone can make chapati well? I've tried it and mine have turned out probably closer to tasting like cardboard. When you, when you finish kneading the dough, add a bit of oil and let it sit for about 10 to 20 minutes. And how do you know when, uh, when to flip the chapati? When it starts having brown patches, but not, okay. not burnt. Okay. The pan had taken long to heat up because I had switched it off. I had a ready chapati. Okay. And so is street food quite a big thing in Uganda, Joanita? Yes, it is. Because um, one, it's affordable. And two, it's a quick meal. Yeah. With everything inside. Two eggs. The carrots, mm. the salt, the egg seasoning that I make myself. The this one that I'm making has carrots and onions. Carrots. Okay. Yeah. So a small dash of oil. You feel it's the body's enough. Okay. It's firm enough for you to flip. To flip. Okay. Mm -hmm. What kind of spices can someone use? Um, you can you use uh, black pepper if you don't like the egg smell. Black pepper and salt. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I think if it was on the sort of roadside, you'd, you'd just be getting salt in there probably for the omelette. Very tasty, lovely. The omelette look like this. Okay. How long do we have the chapati on the egg? Uh, enough for you to see the egg below it has rise, rise with the chapati. That's when you know the egg below is ready. Okay. Mm. All right. And we have a question um, from Kate. What kinds of spices are used? when seasoning the eggs or the chapati. Are there salt, any other spices you add? Salt or black pepper, whichever you choose. Ah, okay. 
And have you ever done uh, Rolexes without eggs? We've got some folks who are vegan. So yes. what might be a substitute they can use there? The substitute is more vegetables with uh, roll it in the chapati. So I'm done with the Rolex here. I already have ready chicken okay. that I use the ingredients that is on the that I listed. Great. So you have your chicken to add so the chicken here. Done. So that's with your chicken seasoning. Um, okay. Coriander, black pepper, salad. mainly. This is salad that I'm okay. adding to the Rolex. What's in your salad, okay. Juanita? Tomatoes? Cucumber, tomatoes, green pepper, onion, vinegar, salt. Okay. And how did you cook the chicken strips? I put a little bit of oil, chicken strips, add a little bl uh, black pepper, coriander, cover it for a bit, then come and just keep turning it until it sweats out the water. That's how you know that it's ready. Great. Mm -hmm. And we have a question that it seems similar to Murtabak, which I think is a South Asian type pancake. Is there any relation there with chapati? No. Oh, I would say the chapati, More I like think, paranta. is similar to, yes. Indian. Yep. Great. This is ketchup. I make myself. Okay. This is my as well, that I make myself. Chili is optional. It's there. Uh, okay. So. Okay. I roll it. Well, and that's the famous rolling that gives us the name, perhaps, <laughs> of the Rolex. And so it's always served in two halves like that? Yes, please. Oh, fantastic. And that's the Rolex. Oh, wonderful. Ooh, thank you so much, Joanita. What is what is the future for Rolex Chick? There's a lot in store. We have a uh, spice line condiments and to grow the Rolex generally. Yeah. And to add other street food to it. Thanks so much for that demo, uh, Joanita. A huge, huge thank you to our panelists today, Sophie, Joanita, and Jonathan, um, just for the very generous gift of your time. Um, a very big thank you also to, to that A team behind the scenes, Simeon, Steph, and Nana. And of course, the biggest thanks of the night uh, just to all of you guys for tuning in. Um, keep up with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, see you on May 30th. Thanks so much once again. Everyone keep safe and take care of yourselves. Bye for now. <laughs>